All right, we'll start our uh, second chapter on thermodynamics. In this chapter, we will look at entropy and free energy. In the last chapter, which we studied last semester, we looked at um, energy and enthalpy, and it's those three functions that we uh, learn about in general chemistry. So we save the entropy and free energy to the second semester. It's a little bit more difficult, and um, it's the complement to what uh, you've learned before. So we'll start the discussion with entropy. And entropy has the symbol S. And if you want to look at the change in the entropy, it's uh, delta S. So what is entropy? And most people think that it has to do with chaos. Usually that's an answer that I get from students. But uh, uh, in terms of kind of a more of a mathematical concept, <clears throat> we say that it's related to disorder. So when a system becomes disordered, that has something to do with entropy. Nothing really to do with heat, although we can use heat equations to calculate some aspects of entropy changes, but uh, it really has to do with more of the order, let's say, of the molecules in an ice cube versus the disorder of the molecules in liquid water, for example. You can picture that. Um, some other terms that we use when we talk about entropy is probability. And also, we talk about the spontaneous process. All right, so some examples, I think, are in order here. And uh, the first one would be a uh, container of gas. Usually, uh, you know, you can put them in some metal containers or some glass containers. And uh, this would be a bulb of some gas, nitrogen perhaps. And um, these, uh, this uh, system would be closed by a stopcock and then connected to another glass bulb to illustrate the example here. And on the right, we have vacuum, okay? So what's gonna happen when we open the stopcock? Okay, so I'll just put like an open circle there. Um, that's supposed to be open on both sides. Uh, what will happen? So the answer is that the molecules are gonna spread out. And if the volumes are the same, then um, you'll have this equal numbers of molecules on either side, and they would be half, half of what they were originally. So that's kind of an obvious thing. And um, the question is, what would happen if we started with the um, picture on the right here, where, where the molecules were um, spread out evenly, and then maybe ask the question, what is the probability that all the molecules in an instant in time will move over to the left-hand side and become um, a vacuum on the right and uh, all the molecules on the left? So what is the probability of that going back? The answer is pretty small. We'd say zero. We don't see molecules just all hop over to one side of a system. So um, that's kind of the way to think about it. The probability of it happening going from left to right is high probability. And uh, if the stopcock's open, it'll be low probability for it to go back. So uh, with regard to the disorder, we can think about the molecules in the gas and the fact that they're moving around in the container. And you say, okay, this molecule has you know, a 50% chance of being on the left, a 50% chance of being on the right, whereas over here, the molecule can only be in one position. So each molecule can, has an equal probability of being on either side. <clears throat> and if we were just taking photographs, for example, of every instant in time, 
you could see molecule A would be here, the next incident would be here, the molecule C would be here, the next incident it would be here. And so that's referred to as a more disordered system. What's the probability of going back? Zero. Probability is a number that goes from zero to one. <clears throat> Okay, so then um, another example would be an ice cube. Oops. And an ice cube, you know what that looks like. And then if it's at room temperature, what's the probability that it's going to melt? The probability is going to be high going in the forward direction. But at room temperature, what's the probability of going back? And the answer is going to be zero. And the probability that all the molecules that have all these different arrangements in that liquid phase are suddenly going to become ordered and move uh, into a cube, uh, the probability is going to be zero again. <clears throat> so also, when we talk about the word spont spontaneous or spontaneity, we say that this, the... Um, the spont it's spontaneous going in this direction. It is non-spontaneous going in this direction. And um, <clears throat> we say entropy favor uh, or a, a positive entropy change would be associated with the spontaneous process. <clears throat> All right, so then uh, you get the idea and uh, make a few statements here. The system tends to move spontaneously to a state of maximum disorder. So again, in, in the, in the uh, liquid state of water, um, again, think of it just taking pictures of it. In one instant, you've got an arrangement of the molecules. and the next instant, the molecules have moved into a different arrangement. So the, the idea of disorder is how many different arrangements are possible. And we would say, you know, it's very much higher in the liquid state than the solid. Uh, and the other thing to say here would be um, that the spontaneous... process, excuse my handwriting here, my hand's in a weird position, uh, is associated with the more disordered state. <laughs> and, uh, the third thing we would say is that delta S, the change in entropy, is positive uh, which is associated with more disorder. So delta S then would be equal to S2 minus S1. Your initial S1 uh, state would have a low entropy for the examples that I've given. And then the final state, two, would have a certain you know, level of disorder. There'd be an entropy associated with that, which would be greater than uh, that of S1. So the difference between them is going to be positive. And then we can say that um, you know, there's a direction associated with the spontaneous process. The direction that the system will move in is to the state of maximum disorder. All right, well, it's an interesting uh, idea here. And um, entropy, you know, when we talk about disorder and how many disordered states are there, you can think of it as uh, having a numerical value. And uh, Boltzmann was a uh, European scientist. He was Austrian. 
and Boltzmann lived from 1844 to 1906. He was a professor uh, in Austria, the University of Graz, I think, but actually he was a professor in different places in Germany and in Austria during this period of his life. And he had a very unique uh, interpretation of entropy. Uh, the thinking uh, during his uh, time as professor, the thinking by his colleagues was that the entropy had something to do with heat, and there were certain equations for entropy that were derived using uh, equations from heat and normal thermodynamic uh, equations. And Boltzmann had a very different way of thinking about it. He thought about all the different ways that molecules can be arranged. And uh, this is S is equal to K log W is Boltzmann's equation. S is the entropy, K is Boltzmann constant, Boltzmann's constant. So it's just a constant and has a value 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 joules per Kelvin. And um, it's just, I'm going to talk some more about, well, let me just finish here. W is equal to the number of ways the system can be arranged. All right, so <clears throat> uh, Boltzmann's constant, just a little comment on that. If you um, take the ratio of the ideal con gas constant R, so R is 8.8, 314 joules per uh, mole per Kelvin, per degree Kelvin. And if you divide that by Avogadro's number, um, this is just one symbol for Avogadro's number there, N for number of molecules, A for Avogadro, uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, and this is going to be molecules per mole, atoms per mole, whatever it is, it turns out that that is equal to um, Boltzmann's constant. So if you take the ratio of those two, you're going to get that same number I just gave you, 1.38, 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. And that would be per molecule rather than per mole. You can see how the moles are going to, per mole uh, uh, units are going to cancel there. So you can think, you know, what is Boltzmann's constant? It's like the the ideal constant, ideal gas constant, sorry. Um, but then you just, it's per molecule instead of per mole. And also, there's another equation that comes up. Um, if you had one mole of your system, then this is how many molecules you would have, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. So there's another equation here that's just, you know, if you had n moles, n times r would be equal to the number of molecules times k. So in other words, I'm taking this and um, multiplying it times n mole, n number of moles, and multiplying n a times k. So if it were something other than a mole, this would be the equation that we would use. And there's just this relationship between them that's kind of interesting. All right, so I'm just going to give you different ways to think about entropy, and hopefully it'll all just kind of come together for you. I'm going to go through a couple of different things here. So um, for this one, all right, in this example, I'm going to show you um, a way you can think about molecules and how they or how many you can count the number of arrangements we're going to use a simple example here where we have two books and you want to put them on the bookshelf and um, we're going to first let's say the bookshelf looks like this so you got these shelves and you got two books maybe you put one on uh, 
the lowest shelf and one on the next uh, shelf going up and they're both on the left hand side. So we want to talk about the possible ways that we can arrange the books here in the on the left hand side of this bookcase or bookshelf and how many ways you could do it. <clears throat> so we're going to use the restriction that the books are on the left hand side and we're going to also say that um, there's one book per shelf. Okay, so how many ways could you do this? I'm going to go quickly because I know the answer and we have other things to talk about besides this. So <coughs> the answer is three. So you can have one book here, one book here. The next one would be second shelf, third shelf, and the next one would be first shelf, third shelf. So there's going to be three ways to arrange the books on the bookshelves. Here we would say that W equals three. The number of ways that you can arrange the books on the shelf is three. Now another example here would be if you have the two books again, and now uh, can be on the left or the right side. So in other words, we have um, lifted the restriction here. And now the books can be on either side. <clears throat> and the question is how many, um, how many ways would that be possible? And to go quickly, the answer is nine, but let's just visualize it. So you could have one on the left, one on the right, at the, on the top shelf, one on the top, one in the middle, one on the top, one on the bottom. Then you can have one in the middle, one on the top, middle, 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 lower. And then you can have one on the bottom, top, bottom, middle, bottom, and bottom. So in this case, <clears throat> if you lift the restriction, the number is going to be 9, the number of ways that the books can be arranged. And maybe you could see that this might be analogous to the gases on the left-hand side of that stopcock, and you open the stopcock, and then the, the molecules can spread out. It's, it's analogous to that. All right, so then, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let us use Boltzmann's equation and calculate the entropy. So for uh, the first state, where they had to both be on the left-hand side, we're going to have k is equal to the log of 3. No, that's wrong. We're going to have k s is equal to k log 3. And we'd say 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd uh, joules per Kelvin times the natural log of 3. And this works out to be <clears throat> 1.5 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. Then S2, so in other words, now you let the books be on <coughs> either side. Now there's nine ways you can arrange those books, and it's going to, the entropy will be 1.38 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin times the natural log of 9, and that is going to be 3.0 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. There are two ways to get the entropy. Delta S would be equal to S2 minus S1, which would be 3.0 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin minus 1.5 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. 
and then that would be equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. Okay, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it would be to say delta S is equal to, um, let's just simplify it with the formula first. So K log W2 divided by W1, and then that's going to be 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin, and multiply that times the log of 9 over 3, which is the log of 3, and we know the log of 3 is uh, 1.5 times 10 to the minus, oops, times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin. So either way works. You can subtract them or you can substitute them into the log equation and take the ratio there. All right, this is an important equation right here, okay, as well as the subtraction. So then you have entropy um, change, which is equal to a very small number, 10 to the minus 23 joules. And, um, you know, we're just talking about two books here. So we could then um, think about this on a larger scale. If we had a mole of substance, you'd be multiplying that number times Avogadro's number. And then, um, <clears throat> then you'd have 1.5 joules per Kelvin. And if we had many moles, the, the delta S uh, change associated with that would be significant and it would be comparable to the enthalpy changes that we calculated last semester. All right, so that's a good example there. And then another example involves um, some coins in a box that can have the arrangement of heads and tails. And we'll start with the example of two coins. And you put them in a box. They could start out being head, head, or tail, tail. We're going to call that the perfectly ordered state. And then we're going to shake the box. And then the question is, how many arrangements would there be? So if there are a way that you could identify a head on molecule A and a head on molecule B, then you'd be able to say that there were uh, four arrangements possible. After you shake it, you could get, get them both heads. One could be head, the other one could be tail. One could be tail, the, the other one could be head, and then you could get tail, tail. So the number W is four for this, the number of possible arrangements would be W. So notice that you have the relationship W is equal to two squared. And here we're gonna say that <clears throat> two would be the number of possible arrange uh, configurations maybe, number of configurations, head or tail is gonna be two. And this would be the number of molecules, or in this case, it's gonna be coins. So just to show that that's true, uh, well, first of all, you can say uh, four is equal to two times two. You could say the first uh, coin has the independent probability of being head or tail, and the second one also has the independent probability of head or tail, and so you multiply the two independent probabilities to get the total number there. Uh, multiply the number of config, uh, head or tail configurations. But they're independent, and that's why you can do that. <clears throat> All right, so then if you had three coins instead in the box, start out with a perfectly ordered set. And I'm going to look at my notes and go very quickly through this. If we shook it up, you could have head, 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 tail, Tail, head, head, tail, 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 H, head, two more, T, H, T, and H, T, T. So it turns out that there's eight ways that uh, the, the coins can be configured after shaking. 
we have W is equal to 2, it can be either head or tail, raised to the number of coins, which is 3, and that's going to be 8. So there's going to be 8 arrangements or 8 ways that the coins can be arranged. Now, if you had a mole of coins, then W would be 2, head or tail, raised to the 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd uh, coins. <clears throat> we could use the symbol 2 to the NA for Avogadro's number. That would work. And in this case, um, if, for example, you could arrange it you'd, if, and make the perfectly ordered set, so every single one of them is heads, let's say, S1 would be equal to K log, there's only one arrangement, so there's going to be one for W, and K log W, uh, K log 1 is equal to 0. Now we're going to shake it, and now we have an entropy that we can calculate here, K log 2 to the power of Avogadro's number, and the best way to deal with this is to take this power and take it out of the logarithm and it becomes multiplicative. So we're going to have S2 would be Avogadro's number times K times ln2. And if you remember the equation I gave you earlier, Avogadro's number times K uh, would be equal to nr. So nr, you, and you can plug it in either way. You can say, let me put it on the left here. S2 is equal to 1.38. Sorry, I put that in the wrong order. S2 equals uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd per Kelvin. I meant to say per mole. Per mole. And then times... Boltzmann's constant, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules per Kelvin times the logarithm of 2. And this works out to be 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin times the logarithm of 2. And this is equal to 5.76 joules per Kelvin per, from a mole of substance, S2. So then delta S, the change in entropy is 5.76 minus 0. So it's 5.76 joules per Kelvin for one mole of substance. Now this is positive. So we're seeing that when the entropy increases, in other words, the number of ways that the molecules can be arranged is uh, greater after shaking the box. And so we're going to have a positive entropy change associated with that process. It's positive right there. All right, then we'll just make a few uh, more statements here. Um, about entropy and the first one is that in the universe there are more instances of entropy increasing than entropy decreasing Entropy increasing or entropy change being positive than entropy decreasing. And, you know, if a system undergoes a change and it becomes more ordered, that's going to be entropy decreasing in that example. But since the natural tendency is for the disordered state to form and then stay that way. That's why we say there's more. In, there are more instances of entropy increasing or entropy changes being positive. 
And this is just uh, a fact. I mean, in biological systems, you have lots of examples of negative entropy, but in general, you know, if you have a piece of iron and it rusts, that's a permanent state, and that would be uh, considered to be the disordered state from the chemical reaction. So uh, it leads us to the second law of thermodynamics, which says that um, in the universe, and you want to remember that the universe is the sum of the system and the surroundings. Uh, that's something I, I didn't discuss thoroughly at all last semester, but um, we always in thermodynamics we always talk about the universe being the sum of the system and the surroundings. So um, from that, we can say that the second law of thermodynamics, delta S, change in entropy for the universe overall is going to be greater than zero. That means that the entropy of the universe is increasing in time. OK, also, we have the third law. And the third law has to do with uh, a perfect crystal. And what is the entropy associated with a perfect crystal? So a perfect crystal might be some atomic system, like helium, for example. The rare gases are good examples for that because they're nonpolar and they just kind of line up perfectly in a crystal. So you can imagine a perfect crystal at zero degrees Kelvin. And the third law would say for, whoops, for a uh, perfect crystal, at zero Kelvin, S is equal to zero. So the entropy is zero. Now, in the case where you don't have a perfect crystal, but you've got it at zero Kelvin, you can still talk about the entropy. It's not necessarily going to be zero. So <clears throat> what if you had the molecule carbon monoxide? leave out these lone pairs, you could imagine <coughs> in the solid uh, form that, <coughs> excuse me, they might line up this way since it's polar, right? The positive is going to line up with the negative. And you could imagine some kind of an array like this. But then all of a sudden, something happens, and it lines up the other way. You know, it's still a solid. All the molecules are arranged in the solid, but here you've got this uh, switch in the configuration. And you can think of that as being a, a really, I've given you one out of nine there, but you could think of that as a 50-50 uh, possibility, <clears throat> especially if there weren't polar forces involved in that. And so there's a way to uh, talk about the entropy here. It's called the residual entropy. And um, it's a number that you can, you can calculate that, and also you can extrapolate your graph uh, that I'm getting ready to show you down to zero Kelvin, and you, there's a numerical value associated <coughs> with the disorder, just associated with the packing in this case at, at low temperatures, at zero Kelvin. So we can make a list now of um, four different ways to consider entropy changes. There's many more, but there's four that I want to talk about uh, for this chapter, and it's things that chemists are interested in, in general. So we can talk about the four ways to increase or decrease the entropy. And, you know, the decrease would just be the opposite of what I'm going to be describing here. So the first way we've already talked about, that's the shuffling. Well, I didn't really talk about shuffling of the cards, but shuffling of the cards can... You could start with a perfectly ordered set, shuffle them, and you have a disordered set. So shuffle, shaking, the coins in the box, mixing gases, for example, and we use Boltzmann's equation, K log W2 over W1 to calculate delta S. So that would be the first way, first type of entropy change. Second one is associated with heating and 
or phase transitions. And um, there are two equations for that. Uh, one of them involving Q equals MC delta T, and the other one is associated with just the phase transitions. So let me finish my list and I'll come back to number two. So the third way is um, increasing the number of molecules molecules in a reaction. So you start with two molecules on the left, you end up with three molecules on the right. That's an increase in entropy. And also you can talk about phase changes. So you go from solid to liquid to vapor during a chemical reaction. And um, there's an entropy increase for that as well. And then the fourth one, is you can calculate delta S using tables. So um, there can be entropy changes associated with that, and you can prove it by doing the calculations. All right, so I want to show you the, um, the second one, heating and or phase transitions. There's a graph for that. And so let's see, before I show you this graph, <clears throat> Do you remember last semester that we were looking at the temperature change of the system, let's say it's H2O, as heat is added, and we had this graph with the five steps. The first one is associated with solid and heating, so it's heated, and the equation was Q is MC delta T, if you recall, for H2O, solid, actually, I don't, you probably don't remember it, but it's around 2.2 2 .2 for the solid. Then uh, this would be the solid <clears throat> to liquid phase transition for the horizontal line. Then the liquid has been formed and then the liquid is heated in this step. And again, it's Q is equal to MC delta T and this time the heat capacity is four point, where the specific heat is 4.184 joules per mole Kelvin, joules per gram Kelvin, sorry. And then in this part, you have liquid going to gas or vapor that's the phase transition, and then this would be the vapor heating up. Same equation, Q equals MC delta T, but the value of um, C is different again. Okay, so maybe remember that. Uh, the equations that we had uh, here were delta H um, fusion, this value right here, and then this value would be uh, delta H vaporization. So we talked about that. And the phase transition is zero degrees C and 100 degrees C. So anyway, what does the entropy look like here? Similar, but different as well. So in this case, we're looking at entropy versus temperature. And start out with the solid again. Uh, if it's a perfectly ordered set, you're going to have entropy equals zero the, uh, the, at absolute zero Kelvin. So the temperature here would be zero Kelvin. And the melting point for H2O would be 273.15. The boiling point, 373.15 Kelvin. And... Um, so anyway, you can take your, if, if it's not a zero entropy, you just start up a little bit higher and start moving across like that. So this part right here would be the residual entropy value. Then you're gonna heat up the solid and uh, would you think that the entropy would increase? 
the answer is yes. There's just more movement of the molecules around those lattice sites in the solid. Finally, you get it when you get up to 273 or 0 degrees uh, C, then it's going to melt, and I made a bad choice on the scale here. You're going to get a huge increase in entropy during the uh, melting. I have to put it, <laughs> I have to start over, make it bigger. So it's a huge increase. And then um, now, so this is the solid to liquid transition. Now the liquid, you continue to heat it up, temperature goes up, and uh, the entropy goes up as well. Then the vaporization, again, is a huge change going right off the uh, scale of this graph. And then, um, so this one right here is liquid to vapor, or liquid to gas, and then this would be the vapor phase right there. So it's similar, yet different. You have the entropy increasing, and it's going vertically, as opposed to the heat going horizontally for the same process. So for the entropy, um, the equation's a little bit more difficult, but during the phase transition, the change in entropy for whatever that transition is would be delta H for whatever that transition is, divided by the temperature of the transition in Kelvin. So um, for water, I think I've got that number. Let me put it down below. Put that equation in a box right there. So this would be for any phase transition, solid to liquid or solid to vapor. So delta ST then would be equal to delta HT divided by T. And in the case of water, the um, heat of fusion or melting, delta H fusion divided by temperature of fusion or melting uh, is 6.0 times 10 to the third joules. And then we divide that by 273.15 Kelvin and we end up with a value for the entropy of fusion, which is 22 joules uh, per Kelvin per mole. And I forgot to put the per mole in there. So it'd be joules per um, mole for heat enthalpy. So in terms of the graph, this would be the entropy of fusion. So that difference right there is 22 joules. This is at 273 Kelvin or zero degrees C that that transition takes place. So you can calculate it for the vaporization using the same equation, just different numbers. You want heat of vaporization, temperature of vaporization, 373 Kelvin, <coughs> excuse me. But also, um, 298, if you recall, 298 is considered to be standard thermodynamic temperature. Let me comment on that. So last semester, we studied gases, and the standard gas temperature is 0 degrees C. Thermodynamic standard temperature is 25 degrees C, which is 298 Kelvin. <coughs> So this is the standard temperature, and then this would be the standard entropy. The little zero there indicates standard. That means it's the entropy associated with the 298 Kelvin temperature and one, degree, uh, one atmosphere. Now, you probably are interested in what's going on during these heating phases, and you need calculus for that. You do use Q equals MC delta T, and you're going to divide that by T, and then you're going to integrate it. So do not uh, pay attention to what I'm writing right here, <laughs> but it would be N times the number of moles times the molar heat capacity of water in this example, and um, instead of saying delta T, delta T, this is per mole, and then instead of saying delta T, you say DT, then you divide by T, and then you integrate that. Do not pay attention to this. <laughs> Just for the curious, you have the log of T2 over T1. 
So this would be the equation to calculate the changes during um, these parts. Okay, forget about that. I'm not going to ask you for that, but uh, it's good to know. So focus on this type of calculation um, as far as what you might expect from me. Okay, well, so now the third example there was if you uh, look at a chemical reaction and you have increased number of moles or if the phase is going in the direction of vapor. So uh, we could look at calcium sulfite solid and then that can decompose to form calcium plus sulfur trioxide gas. So does the entropy increase for this reaction when the products are formed? So does entropy increase? And the answer is yes. And that's because it's going from solid to vapor or gas. And also, you got one molecule becoming two. I'll say molecules. One is an atom, the other one's a molecule, but it doesn't matter. You know what I mean. One to two. So we would say, yes, the entropy increases. So which would be a more significant uh, value, numerical value? It's going to be the solid going um, to the vapor phase or the gas phase. That entropy change is a lot larger than just one molecule going to two. Then if you had um, N2 in the gas phase and reacting with hydrogen, and ammonia is being formed here. They're all the gas phase, so that's not a consideration. On the left-hand side, you have four molecules. The right-hand side, you have two. So here you would say <clears throat> entropy decreases, becomes more ordered. You could think of it that way. And um, you could say Delta S is negative up here. Delta S is positive. All right, and then finally, number four, addition of two on the left. This has to do with chemical reactions, so you can calculate it. Calculate the entropy change. So here, um, you remember last semester we had delta H is equal to sum of the delta H's for the products minus the sum of the delta H's for the reactants, and then we were multiplying each one of those terms times coefficients. There's a similar equation here for entropy, and this is Greek letter sigma for sum, uh, the number of in this case, n is the coefficient, but we say number of moles, but coefficient times the standard entropy for the product molecules. You're going to add them up for all the product molecules and multiply each one times their coefficient. Then you're going to subtract the sum of n, s uh, for the reactants. All right, that's kind of weird to write that out, but... The best way to see this is if there's an example. So if you have 2NH3 in the gas phase plus CO2 gas phase forming NH2CONH2, which is urea, that is in solid phase, and then you have liquid water. You can just look at this and say, okay, well, you got a decrease in entropy. No doubt about that, right? So you got three molecules going to two gas phase going to solid and liquid, so you would predict here negative entropy. Now, if you look up the values for the standard entropy, and let me comment on this. So if you go to the standard thermodynamic tables, you're going to have, col you're going to have listed elements and compounds uh, going down um, 
vertically. And then going across, you'll have values for delta H, the entropy, and delta G, the free energy, which we're going to talk about, the Gibbs free energy. And you'll notice that the enthalpy is going to be how many joules there are per mole. Uh, the entropy is different. It'll be just um, joules or kilojoules per Kelvin. And then free energy will be joules per mole again. So um, the other thing is that um, I think I'll hold and talk about it later. But anyway, it's absolute entropies, which you can calculate from that graph as opposed to delta H, a change in entropy. Uh, let's talk about it when we get to the table. Anyway, so you look in the table, you're going to see these absolute entropies. You don't have delta S here. It's just S. That, that was what I was trying to say. The absolute entropies, which you can get from the table that I just showed you. So you look them up, you got 193 joules per Kelvin, 214 for CO2, 104.6 for urea, 70 for water. And then delta S for the reaction, standard, the little zero there means these are the numbers associated with the entropy at um, 298 Kelvin and one atmosphere. So it's going to be products minus reactants. It's all, no, it's not. <clears throat> one to one on the right. You get the <clears throat> so it's going to be 104.6 plus 70. That's for the products, minus 2 times 193 for ammonia, plus 214 for CO2, and <coughs> delta S will be equal to negative 424 joules per Kelvin. So the units for all these values are joules per Kelvin. Okay, so is it negative? Yes, that's what we predicted qualitatively. Uh, now we have a numerical value, and this is uh, much more reliable than just kind of predicting things. But you can certainly say that it makes sense to have negative based on either way you uh, look at that. <coughs> okay, one more, and then we'll um, end this video. The next video will be on Gibbs free energy. So one more um, calculation to look at. And here, this is number four, creation or expansion of a gas. And back to the bulbs, gas bulbs. <coughs> All your molecules are on the left here. Let's say that that's one liter and this is one liter. Then you're going to open the stopcock. Molecules will move. Even distribution here. And uh, in this case, the new volume for the system is two liters, approximately. All right, so there's an increase in entropy associated with that. Let's calculate what it is. We've got delta S is equal to N R L N V2 over V1. Now, this would be the equation der derived from thermodynamics. We're not going to not going to derive this, but uh, remember that N R is equal to Avogadro's number times K, so there is this relationship between Boltzmann's equation and the regular thermodynamically derived equation. And um, it would be log of 2 over 1 in this case. Delta S is going to be, let's look at it for 1 mole, times 8.314 joules per mole per Kelvin, ln 2. Delta S is going to be equal to 5.76 joules per Kelvin. And uh, you might go back and look at the example of the coins. The coins can have a head or tail configuration. And uh, you're going to get 5.76 for that uh, calculation as well. And maybe uh, the other way to think about this one 
is uh, from a Boltzmann's approach, we would say delta S would be K log 2, meaning that each molecule has a choice of being on the left-hand side or the right-hand side, same as like a head or a tail. Choice is not the right word there, but probability would be better. And N would be um, the number of coins, or in this case, it would be the number of molecules. So if you have um, <clears throat> a mole, so for one mole, delta S would be equal to NK ln 2, which is exactly what we had for the coins, 5.76 joules per Kelvin. <clears throat> Losing my voice there. All right, I'll stop here and start with the next video.